So 2024 is off to a start. It's a start, right? We can definitely say that. But in this episode, we are gonna talk about some ways that you can make it a successful year as a motion designer. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. I'm sure that's no surprise, but I also thought it'd be a good idea to poll the motion design community. So I did that on X and on LinkedIn. I wanna thank everybody who responded and gave me feedback. So you're gonna be hearing from them too, not just me in this episode. It may be a little bit of a rambling one, but bear with me. So let's start by talking about the economy because a lot of this trickles down from the economy. Now, what you're looking at is a chart of the S&P 500 stock index for the US stock market. Why the hell am I showing you this? Well, this is a good proxy for the overall health of the US economy. And the US economy is a decent proxy for the overall health of the motion design economy because the biggest companies on earth are in the US and the biggest motion design clients on earth tend to be in the US and the biggest motion design economy is here and there are ripple effects of what happens here all over the world. So if you look at this chart, you'll notice that it's been going up and to the right since about the end of October. So it looks great, right? Hopefully we're out of the woods. It looks like we're sort of leaving that post-COVID bubble pop recession nastiness we had last year, right? It's going up to the right. That's the direction you want. And yet, unfortunately, there are still pretty big layoffs happening across technology and other sectors. So this is a chart of just tech layoffs, and you can see that the bulk of them, the biggest spike, was early last year. That was basically when the bubble popped, and we had giant rounds of layoffs, and Elon Musk bought Twitter and laid off like 70 or 80% of the staff. And the reason he did that is actually the exact same reason that a lot of these layoffs are happening too. So I'll talk about that in a second. But very recently, Discord announced layoffs, Twitch announced a pretty big round of layoffs, YouTube had layoffs, Google had layoffs, Amazon had layoffs. And it's gonna continue into this year for sure. Google CEO Sundar Pakai just announced that Google is planning to do layoffs in 2024 to hit their goals. So why are these layoffs happening? Well, the short version is it's because these companies found themselves in the unenviable position of spending more money than they're making. And there's a lot of reasons for that. A heck of a lot of it had to do with the inflationary things that were happening during the pandemic and the bubble popping. And we went through a very, very slow 2023, basically every company on earth. And there was a ton of layoffs last year. In a nutshell, that's the main cause. There's also other reasons like AI is becoming actually useful for certain jobs. And so companies can use that to cut costs. I know that's not gonna make very many people happy, but it's reality. But the primary driver of this is companies are now in a position that they weren't necessarily in two or three years ago. They have to get lean and efficient at all costs. And so what does that mean? Well, it typically means that they're gonna have to lay people off, unfortunately, because the most expensive line item of any business is gonna be salaries and contractor payments. Basically, people are the most expensive part of running a business, and for good reason. People are, you know, the drivers of the value of the business. But when a business has to cut costs, they have to cut people. So which people are going to get let go, which people are gonna be kept, and when the company starts hiring again, Who are they gonna hire? The mindset of every company is shifting right now. It's not the same as it was a couple years ago. What companies are looking for is efficiency, high output individuals. And so here's my thesis for 2024. The way to have the most successful version of your career that you can have this year is to increase your output as a motion designer. Now I know that sounds gross and it may sound like I'm just telling you work harder. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you need to increase your output and there's two ways to do it. The first way is to literally increase your output, but that doesn't just mean work more hours and make more stuff. What it means is make more stuff than you're currently making, but figure out how you can do that without working harder. And that may sound like an oxymoron, I promise you it's not. I'm gonna talk about a lot of really cool tools and ways that you can increase your output. And some of the people that wrote in when I was asking for input on this episode actually said, I did this, I increased my output, it really helped me last year. And this year I think it's gonna be even more important, so we'll talk about that. But another way to increase your output that I think may be even a better strategy and maybe more interesting to you is to increase the range of things you are good at. Expand your skill set. If you have two artists at a company and one can only design, but another one can design, not as good as this one, but this one can design, animate, do 3D, do some video editing. This one is objectively more valuable to the company in almost every situation. Sure, you could come up with some thought experiment where that's not the case, but that's almost always the case. 
Having more skills as a full-time employee means you can work on more complex problems. You can lead jobs by yourself because you understand more pieces of the project, of the flow of things. And at a very practical level, you probably have less downtime where you're being paid to sit around waiting for work to do because if you're not designing, you can be animating. And if you're not animating, you can be editing. And there's a million different versions of this scenario that is gonna be unique to every single person watching this. So in 2024, my main piece of advice is to start thinking of how you can make yourself more of a full stack designer. This is a term I think I started hearing a year or two ago, and I don't know if this is the right term for motion designers, but we're gonna use it for this episode and see, see if it sticks. I like the term full stack. So full stack, if you don't know it, it generally comes from the world of software development where developers would tend to specialize in one aspect of development or another. And the terms you'd usually hear is front end developer or back end developer. And we don't really need to get into the details of this, but essentially a full stack developer can do both. And so if you wanna build an app, you need a full stack developer or you need a front end developer and a back end developer. Now, which one from an employer standpoint sounds more appealing to you? All right, now I'm grossly oversimplifying it. And of course there's reasons that you want a dedicated front end person, a dedicated back end person. But in general, having more abilities and more skills and being more of a generalist is going to help your career. School of Motion's philosophy from day one has always been to try and help our students become better generalists. Now, of course, you do not have to be a generalist, and there are plenty of examples of artists out there, some of whom I know really well and have been on this podcast, that are not generalists. Justin Harder is a great example. He is a designer. He can animate a little bit, but he doesn't, he doesn't really like to. He's a designer. But if that's you, if you're gonna be a specialist, you better be as good as Justin Harder. You better be really, really, really good. You better be like Peter Tarka or Mulan Fu or Zach Lovett or Rosie Philpot. Your ability in your niche better be at that level if that's all you're gonna focus on in 2024 because there's a lot more competition than there was three, four years ago. But if you have a full stack set of skills, you can plug into so many places. And what's cool about 2024 is there are some really amazing opportunities out there for motion designers who already have some skills and you can add one or two more and all of a sudden you get this entirely new frontier to explore for your career. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So April McMillan, a recruitment marketing manager slash content creator slash book designer, See, this is a full stack designer right here. She wrote in and said, have other marketable skills besides motion design. You might end up at a job where motion design is just a tiny part of what you do. I think for most of you watching this, that will be intuitive, but I know there are some of you out there that have spent your entire career working in maybe the studio system, or you've been at an agency, or maybe you've been freelancing, but you've just been doing motion design. That's totally cool. That's a perfectly valid career option. But my point, and I think April's point too, is that, if that doesn't work, you don't have a whole bunch of other options if all you can do is motion design. If you're also a decent copywriter, if you're also decent at understanding how YouTube works so you can design really effective thumbnails or you know how to write titles for YouTube videos, or you get really good at using ChatGPT in ways to generate content or to help make social media posts or to come up with ideas, these are skills you probably already have, but if you hone them and you make that part of the package that you bring to the table when someone hires you, you can now plug into a lot more places than just a motion design studio or a motion design role. Now you can fit into a ton of marketing roles and you're still doing motion design, you're still being creative, but because you have this suite of skills, there's more opportunity. Beach Chickens writes in, I really don't know who this person is, but I love their uh, I love their name. Beach Chickens says, having a unique style might not matter as much as people say it does. To this comment, I say, yes, I agree, sort of. This is true, but it really depends on your goals. And this was another thing I heard a lot from people who wrote in. It depends what your goals are. What does success even mean to you? It may mean something different to me, it probably does. But what I imagine Beach Chickens is trying to tell us here is that having your own style may seem like something of a luxury when there's not a ton of work out there. And if you have a unique style that isn't really popular at that moment, you may not get a lot of work. But again, it depends on your goals. What is your goal? Is your goal to freelance and be booked 50 weeks out of the year and constantly be working on a variety of different things? Maybe having a unique style is helpful there, but probably doesn't matter. You don't need a unique style to do that. 
But if your goal is to work on really, really high-end work and work on a few projects a year that really have your voice in it and you're gonna charge a ton of money for those, but they're gonna be few and far between, well, yeah, having a unique style and a unique voice is imperative in that situation. And by the way, you can make the exact same amount of money doing both things. But my point is having a unique style is way more useful for one of those than the other. And in the past, I think in the discourse around design and animation, there has been a lot of talk for good reason about trying to find your voice, find your style. And yeah, I do encourage everyone to do that. But as far as like a professional tactic, if your goal is to simply get booked, get a job and hang on to it, having a unique style isn't actually all it's chalked up to be. Alex Carlson wrote in, he's an associate creative director, and he said, no After Effects like the back of your hand, get a demo reel, learn UX and design, get a solid, nice portfolio, go to a place where there is a large demand for creatives like San Francisco, bonus points, study the 12 principles of animation, buy a copy of The Illusion of Life and the Animator's Survival Kit, and learn Cinema 4D. Well, Alex is basically telling you to become a generalist and then go to where the work is. This is all good advice, but I think a lot of times we forget the basics. Obviously, moving to a place like San Francisco that does have a large demand for creatives, that's kind of a luxury that's just not in the cards for everybody, and I don't think that it's absolutely required. It will make it easier to find work, for sure. But all of the other things Alex points out, these, to me, are kind of common sense things that not everybody keeps at the top of their mind all the time. I've done so many portfolio reviews in the last year, and I can tell you, like a lot of artists, you know, probably 75% of artists would get more out of just reworking their portfolio and following some best practices than learning another tool or doing anything else, right? So just worry about the basics first. If you got all this stuff down, then you can move on. Now, one more thought on this whole idea of full stack designer. So in motion design, you know, we've been using the term generalist for a long time. And that's basically what I mean by full stack designer. But I think that in the past, it's really meant you can design and you can animate. And then it started to include, you can also do some 3D, okay? So let's call that a generalist. Well, I think that there's this whole other world that has been open to motion designers for probably the past decade, but it's been a little bit hidden and there's been a little bit of a barrier to it. And that world is the world of product and web design. Most websites and products, and by product I mean like apps, like a, a web app or a mobile app, something like that. Most products and websites have motion on them now. And there are so many of those jobs out there and projects and gigs that you can get. But there's always been this problem of translating what we do in After Effects, what we do in Cinema 4D, into a format and sort of a, a usable medium for this world. And in the last couple of years, there's been two tools that have really kind of moved to the forefront of this stuff. One is Rive. You've heard me talk about it a lot on this podcast, and you will hear me talk about it a lot more. And the other one is Spline, which is a 3D cloud-based web app that you can create scenes with and interactions and then embed them on websites and in apps. And it's basically like Rive, but for 3D. It's really, really cool. And these two apps are really dense, complex apps to learn. However, if you're a motion designer and you already know After Effects or you already know Cinema 4D, I'm not kidding when I say for you it will be trivial to learn these tools. You learn them very, very quickly and all of a sudden, you've opened up this enormous door of opportunity that you may not have even known was there. And so think about how something like that impacts your ability to say, I am a full stack designer. Because now you can say, I can design, I can animate, Maybe you also do 3D, and you can do all of that in the traditional linear world of motion design. But I also know Rive, and I know a little bit of Spline, and hey, maybe you also learned a little bit of Webflow, so you can actually implement these things in the site and show your client what it's gonna look like and how the interactions are gonna look on their phone or whatever. Again, these are not super hard things to learn for someone that already knows After Effects. You've learned animation, you've learned design, you know the hard part. The easy part is the software. And I think if you get on the LinkedIn jobs board after you've learned one or both of those tools, you're gonna to see a lot more opportunities that line up with your skills. Now, I wanna take a minute and talk to those of you that are just starting out because a lot of what I just talked about really only applies if you already have some skills and you're gonna expand your skill set. What if you have no skills and you're walking into the industry in 2024 and you're hearing me say things like, there's more competition now, companies are cutting costs, they're looking for high output individuals. What can you do when you're starting out? So my advice to you is this. First of all, you are going to have to learn 
probably After Effects. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's step one, and you can knock that out in a few weeks. I know a great course I can recommend. But once you've got that down, what you need to do is practice design and practice animation. There are more people who know After Effects than ever. There's a lot of them. There are still not that many who are good at design and good at animation. Those are still differentiators in this industry. If you know how to make a good ball bounce, if you understand the principle of follow through, or if you understand composition and color theory and typography and you can design nice looking still frames or style frames, then you are so far ahead of the pack still, even today in 2024, just by having basic design and animation skills and knowing After Effects. If you have that and you set up a portfolio, you are going to find opportunities. It may not be as easy as it was a few years ago, but getting your foot in the door at that first job is never super easy. So just be persistent. Make sure you buttoned up with the basics. And then I would recommend adding editing to your arsenal. That's probably not what you thought I was gonna say, but I think that in 2024, especially in the age of AI and with the creator economy being as enormous as it's gotten, I think video editing is having a little bit of a renaissance and video editors are finding that they are worth more than ever. But most video editors are not good at After Effects and are certainly not good at design and animation. Learning to use a video editing app like Premiere, it's technical, it takes a little bit of doing, but if you've learned After Effects, it's far easier to learn than After Effects. Learning the art of editing takes some time, but it's so much fun, it's a superpower, and there's a ton of work out there for editors, especially ones that can also do motion design. After that, I'd probably say 3D is gonna be a really big game changer for you because especially now with the world of product design embracing tools like Spline, 3D is gonna be super popular. So if you learn 3D animation and you can embed that in a website or you can do cool motion design with it or you can use that as part of your video editing repertoire, amazing, that's another differentiator for you. And then maybe think about interaction design, learning a tool like Rive or a tool like Spline. That is gonna be a huge differentiator. I think we're still in the very early days of that, but I feel like in the next 10 years, that is gonna be such a massive field. There's gonna be so many opportunities there. You might as well start now. All right, so let's get back to this idea of being efficient and increasing your output. How can we do that? Well, the short answer is you're gonna use technology to do that the same way humans have done it from time immemorial. Companies are trying to do more with less, and you can do more with less if you have technology. Let me tell you a story. So when I started my career, I was an assistant video editor, and most of my day would often be spent digitizing tapes. You, you may not even know what that means if you were born you know, after the year 2000. This may sound crazy, but video cameras used to shoot on tapes and you have to take the tape and put it into a tape deck that was attached to your computer and the computer would control the tape deck and you would have to set an in point and an output like, okay, these five minutes was me walking around interviewing this person and then these 10 minutes was B-roll of this location and then you'd hit record and then the tape deck would literally have to play the tape in real time and your computer would record it and a lot of times it would like crap out in the middle and you'd have to restart that part and it would take all day just to get the footage from the tapes into your computer. And then if you wanted them transcribed, what you typically have to do is make a copy of the tape, which is again a real-time process, so you could send that copy out to a transcription service that would then give you a transcript back, often in paper form. And so you couldn't even start editing stuff for days sometimes. Now, if you got an editing job today, and you said, this is how I work. I'm going to do it this way. Because believe me, you're still working your butt off when you're doing that. You're doing stuff constantly. It's a lot of work. So you feel like you're working hard. But if you told someone that's how I'm going to edit now, they look at you like you're crazy. Now you're going to get a hard drive. You're going to copy that hard drive onto whatever your editing hard drive is. That's going to take, I don't know, maybe a half hour. And then when you import it into Premiere, you're going to wait about 10 minutes and you're going to have a transcript. So you're gonna start editing that day in maybe two, three hours. And it's even better than that because now there's actually these things that Frame.io make where you can beam your footage from the set literally as you're shooting it through the cloud. It can create proxy files. You can edit almost instantly these days. And so why wouldn't you? You're gonna work just as hard, but you're getting more done. The output increases. And I think as motion designers, it often hasn't been as obvious as that example how we can increase our output. Because so much of what we do, it's 
so finicky. There's so much nuance to it, and it just takes forever. If you're animating a walk cycle, to get it right just takes a while. So how can you increase your output? Well, let's go through a few examples. One of the things that takes the longest often is the design part of the process. And I think that's partially because we like to design. Designing is really fun. That's one of the reasons that we get into this field. But if you're doing this professionally, you're doing this for a client that you've worked with a lot, you know their brand, you know what style they like, you don't always have to design things from scratch. And in fact, often you don't want to. You want to use pre-made assets, stock, design libraries. God forbid you may want to use a template. Leverage your taste to know what's good so you can assemble something together very, very quickly that looks good and that will work and that will function and know deep in your heart that it won't be as satisfying for you because you didn't design it all and there's always that part in the back of your mind saying, ah, but I didn't design that and know that it will make zero difference to the bottom line of that client. In fact, it will improve their bottom line because you can do that way faster. You can design 10 storyboards that way a lot faster than you can if everything you do is from scratch. You can be strategic about the projects that you're very, very precious about. You can save that preciousness for your personal projects where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. But when you're doing that fourth job for your bank client, go ahead and get on Adobe Stock and grab some elements and animate those instead of creating everything from scratch. Go find an open source icon library and just grab them and animate them. Get on Lottie files and see if there's any pre-made little fireworks and thumbs up animations and things like that that you could just reuse. I know it doesn't feel as good, but you are doing this as a job. And so you need to treat it as such, especially in times like now. So here's a message from Seb Lom, who is the brother of Jan Lom, our buddy that runs ThinkMojo, their co-founders. And he said that he thinks it's gonna be useful to become 10 times more productive thanks to AI. And he lists out a whole bunch of tools like Stable Diffusion, Mid Journey, ChatGPT, becoming more, quote, full stack. Hey, we think alike, Seb. Being good at more than just animation, storyboard, concepts, art direction, sound design makes a huge difference. Now, Seb is a developer and he's building lots of products and SaaS products. Some of them use AI tools. So he's very, very familiar with all this stuff. And I understand there are artists that have very legitimate ethical concerns about using tools like Midjourney, but there are lots of AI tools out there. Midjourney is just one of them. And if there's an ethical consideration with that one, see if there's a different one out there that doesn't have that problem. Maybe Adobe Firefly and the way that they source their media from stock that they actually own and pay artists for, maybe that feels better to you. Using tools like this saves so much time you're kind of crazy to ignore that. And aside from the generative art tools, there's things like ChatGPT, and there's AI tools for cleaning up audio. There's AI Assisted Roto, there's AI King, there's AI baked into almost everything, generative fill in Photoshop. And if you're not becoming familiar with these things, you are going to be slower than people who are. And slowness is gonna be your enemy in 2024. Seb mentioned sound design, and this is one of the things that I think is so cool about this sort of revolution we're going through. So if you're a video editor and you have footage of someone talking, it was recorded with a shotgun mic, and maybe there's like, you know, a little bit of traffic noise in the background and there's music underneath that, and there's some sound design as the graphics come up, you have to mix that in the end. And in the past, that was the realm of specialists who had to very often go to school to learn how to be audio engineers and EQ and compress and do this and that. AI tools are making it so much easier to mix. There's this amazing tool that we've been using at School of Motion lately called Crumple Pop, and it's a suite of audio tools made by Boris FX. Check it out, and it can do magic to audio tracks. So we use it on this podcast all the time. If a guest is in a room and there's a lot of reverb, reverb is one of those things that typically it was almost impossible to remove. Well, now you can use Adobe Podcast to remove it, which does a great job, or you can use Crumple Pop, which also does an amazing job. It can remove traffic noise, it can move air conditioner noise, and these are things that used to be very hard to do, and now it's literally a plugin. Premiere has a whole bunch of tools built into it now to make it much easier to mix audio as well. And so in the end, you can be a motion designer who can do a little bit of editing, who can now mix audio. But that's only possible if you embrace these new tools and you're not afraid to learn them and to use them on client work. But if you're willing to do that, you will be much, much closer to being a full stack designer. So here's a comment from designresources.ai. I think the name should probably give you a hint as to what this person thinks, but hot take. AI means that the skill level is trending toward zero. Being an expert in a certain program will lose value. The successful ones will be those that take the role of creative director. 
So I think I mostly agree with this. I think that AI tools, especially the ones that are trying to create video, I think they're mostly useless for the professional stuff that we tend to do as motion designers. The image generator is a different story, but the video generators I don't think are actually working well enough or anywhere close to it to threaten the kind of work that we do. But I do think that what these tools are doing is opening up kind of a new type of work that still benefits from having really creative people with good taste working on it. And so the way I kind of interpret this comment is that taste is gonna be a huge differentiator. Now, it's been a differentiator because if you're an artist with good taste, that means typically your own work will reflect that good taste and, and hopefully it will be good as well. Or if you're an art director, the artist you're directing, it will reflect your good taste. But when we bring in AI where I don't have to have the skill of being an incredible 3D artist to build an elaborate scene, but I do need to know when the scene is good. And I do need to know what the scene should even have in it to tell the story or accomplish the business goal that I've been hired to solve. So having creativity and taste becomes an advantage and you can develop those things deliberately by learning new skills. Now, just to kind of drive this point home, I want you to look at this AI generated film. There are probably thousands of these popping up all over YouTube, all over the internet. And the thing about them is that the imagery is often very striking. And if you just looked at a still image of this, you'd be like, wow, that's beautiful. But then when you watch it in context with the slow drifts and the really cheesy writing and the boring editing and the cliche music, like it doesn't make you feel anything. It's just this empty, beautiful vessel. And you may just think that that is the nature of the result you're gonna get when you use these AI tools. And I'm here to tell you that that is not the case. You can use these AI tools and get really amazing results, but you have to know what you're doing. You have to actually be a skilled, creative person who has the technical skills to pull this off. This is a short film called Critters that's actually really, really good. It's fun to watch, it's well-written, it's got some cute animation in it, it's got some good ideas. And I love this film because it looks like an AI generated film, but it's actually fun to watch. It's good. You can tell whoever did it understands how to make films and understands editing and pacing and direction. But the look of this film would have taken a lot of work to achieve without the AI tools. And so very likely the film wouldn't have been made if those tools didn't exist. So I think this is a good example of the type of thing that in the hands of a skilled creative person, can be created with the help of AI. There's no way AI can just make this for you. You still have to know what you're doing. But if you do know what you're doing, and if you're an experienced motion designer, you know what you're doing, and then you embrace the capabilities that AI tools give you, now you're able to produce a lot more output more quickly, and it's not gonna take you more time. So this was a great comment from our good friend, Ryan Plummer, the plumster himself. Hot take, you need to learn how to make good things faster and I think connected data is going to play a huge role in motion design. Most artists will need to learn how to create in volume and I don't think their ego is ready for it. He's coming in hot. So then Ryan tells this story of a job that he had last year where a client came back and had a silly little revision to something like 170 deliverables. They needed a quotation mark added and it wasn't there and he was thinking to himself, man, if I did this in After Effects, this would be an insane amount of work, but he didn't use After Effects. He used a tool called Cavalry. Cavalry, if you're unfamiliar, is a 2D animation tool that does a lot of the same things After Effects can do, but it's also got some capabilities far beyond what After Effects can do. And it's been slowly gaining more and more adoption with motion designers. It's really a great kind of Swiss Army knife tool like After Effects that you can use with After Effects in conjunction, they work well. One of the great things about it is it works really well with data. So you can set up templates really, really easily and then feed hundreds of rows of a spreadsheet into it and it'll kick out you know, a render for every single row. You can do that in After Effects too, but it's a lot more cumbersome to set up and you generally need plugins to do it. But in Cavalry, it's built right in. So if you're thinking that far ahead, this client may make a last minute change. How can I set things up? What tools can I use so that should that happen, it's only gonna take a couple hours to fix, not two weeks to fix. And Ryan is very good at thinking like that. So maybe familiarize yourself with tools like Cavalry. If you use After Effects, I don't think it's very difficult to learn Cavalry. Same concepts, just a little bit of a different UI. 
Or look at a tool like Plainly. Plainly is a very cool product. I've mentioned it before on the podcast. And it's basically an After Effects render engine in the cloud, but you can trigger After Effects renders from an API if you have a developer, or you can use a no-code tool like Zapier, and you could trigger After Effects renders from, say, a Google Sheet with a whole list of different text layers and image URLs that you wanna plug into the same After Effects file. These tools have existed for years and most motion designers don't use them, but 2024 is gonna be a good time to start picking these things up because tools like this are gonna make you so much faster and more efficient than your competition. I'll also loop Rive into this because what Rive lets you do is animate things and then you can render them out traditionally like you would in After Effects, but you can also export them as assets. And if you build them the right way, we're gonna have some training coming out later this year to teach you how, if you build them the right way, you can basically have one asset that can do a million different things. I think the best proof of this is looking at what Duolingo has done. So Duolingo has changed their entire in-app animation pipeline to use Rive so that they can have multiple different characters with idle animations and success animations. And what's happening with their body can be animated one way and blended together. What's happening with their face can be controlled totally separately so that their mouth can actually sync up to the words that are being generated by the app so you actually have lip sync. And all of this is happening in real time with a Rive file. Now, if you had to create After Effects renders for every single permutation of, you know, the character's idling and saying, ah, the character's idling and saying, oh, the, you know, and, and every mouth shape, and but the, but the right arm's up, the right arm's down, the left arm's up, I mean, it would be so tedious, basically it would be impossible, and it was impossible until there was a tool like Rive where you could bake basically a whole bunch of different states together and control those after you've done the animation. It's a whole new way of thinking, and if you think about the efficiency that that's gonna open up for you, there's a whole bunch of other ways that technology like that can be used as a motion designer to get more out of the time you're putting into something. Now let me stop for a minute to just point out that I know you're thinking, how on earth am I gonna keep track of all of these things? There's so much happening in motion design, it changes so fast. How on earth will I stay in the loop, Joey? Well, it's actually really easy. You're gonna head to motionmondays.com and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. We'll keep you up to date on everything you need to know and we'll make sure that you're aware of conferences and events for motion designers and any news that's important. It's free, it takes one minute to sign up and you will be in the loop. You don't wanna be out of the loop. Do you? I didn't think so. All right, back to the episode. Let's talk about soft skills. So this is something I've been harping on for years. If you've read the Freelance Manifesto, if you've taken the client code, or if you've read any of the essays I've written over the years, I always talk about the importance of soft skills, like being good at communication, being good at getting work, being good at being easy to work with, things like that often way more important than actually being an amazing artist. And I have this theory that this whole AI boom is gonna make it even more important because a lot of us are interacting all day long online. And as more and more of the content that we're seeing is actually generated not by humans, but by AI, I think we're gonna be craving that human connection more than ever. At least I hope that's what's gonna happen. And so if you're a real human, which I assume you are, and you're good at building rapport with people, both online and in person or over Zoom, I think you're gonna really stick out in this new post AI world. So 2024 would be a great year to work on the things that you know you need to work on, but you don't want to because it's not as fun as watching another tutorial or learning Blender or whatever. You need to work on your networking, you need to work on your outreach skills, and you always need to be improving how you interact with the other artists you're working with, that you know that's part of your network too, how you're interacting with your clients, how you're managing your clients, your communication skills, all of those things will be more important than ever. And I know that's obvious, but I have to say it. So Omar Vick, a motion design lead at Oliver Plus, he wrote in, he said, first of all, keeping design and motion principles on check. Well, yeah, that's obvious. Then I'd say being software agnostic. Since so much technology is being put out recently and will continue even more with AI tools, soft skills are top to me as well because I'd prefer working with a mid motion designer who is easy to work with than a senior who is a diva. I love that term mid, that's one of my new favorite words. Okay, so he'd rather work with a mid motion designer than a top diva. And I totally agree with him and surveys I've done bear this out. I wrote about this in the Freelance Manifesto. If you are an amazing artist, you will get booked, but if you're an asshole, you won't get booked again. And that's obvious, most people aren't going to be jerks to their clients, but there's a lot more 
to this than just being nice to someone's face. The way you interact online, the tenor of your social media posts, how you write emails, the formalness or informalness of it, all of those things play into the perception people have of you. And if you don't naturally have the ability to build rapport easily, this is something to work on. I guarantee you'll get so much more out of this than learning another tool. Here's Chris Zachary who echoes a lot of the things that I've talked about already. Being fast, reliable, and easy to work with is more important than artistic talent. Better tools and learning resources are making technical skills less of a competitive advantage. Talent is now default. Your soft skills will get you hired repeatedly. There's not much more to say about that. Being fast, being efficient, being able to create more output, being reliable, being easy to work with. I mean, that's it, it's a simple formula. And here's Brian Clark, a motion designer at Microsoft. How to communicate to a team, creative lead, or to a client, what, why, how. So this is a skill he thinks you need to develop. In my time, I've seen people ghost producers or their whole team or certain blockers and needs aren't communicated to a client, therefore almost tanking a project and relationship. Just like hard skills, soft skills, and specifically communicating timely and correctly go a long way. This advice is 100 times more true if you are a freelancer, if you're on staff, you have a little bit more leeway, although these days keep in mind that staffs are shrinking. I think they will eventually grow again, but we don't know when. And so you need to make sure that you're really bringing your A game, whether you're on staff or you're freelance. People always say you should over communicate and you know that's kind of vague. So here's what I kind of think that means. I think it means maybe adopt the mindset that, especially if you're working remotely, your boss, your creative director, your client, they have no idea what you're doing right this moment. And if that happens for too long, they may start to think, huh, I wonder if Joey's actually getting that job done. I wonder if I should be worried. Should I be worried? I don't wanna be worried, but I'm starting to get a little bit worried. And if you just send a Slack message or an email, hey, quick update, this is what's happening. You'll have something by 4 p.m. And if not, I'll let you know soon. That's it. It takes like, you know, a minute to shoot that message off and all that anxiety goes away. And that is a skill, I promise you, if you develop that muscle, you will not regret it. And Mark Mograff chimes in on this topic also. He says, with the amount of access clients have to cheap labor and the development in AI, soft skills are becoming more and more important. High paying clients wanna work with freelancers who deliver quality and give them peace of mind. AI and cheap labor can't compete with that. And he is dead right about that last thing he said. Clients want peace of mind and AI cannot compete with that. And if you've ever tried to use ChatGPT for something, you know it can be so amazing and so helpful and brilliant and you can never trust it totally, you just can't. I think it's kind of like self-driving cars. Even if on paper they're safer than humans driving, there's something wired into us. We can't quite trust it yet. I'm sure one day we will but that day may not be right now. And so if you can make your client sleep like a baby at night, it doesn't matter that there's some other animator out there that's slightly better than you or can also do 3D and you only do 2D. If your client likes you and they trust you and you've delivered for them and you over communicate and you're friendly and they like you, they're gonna keep hiring you. That's the way it works. Building your network is also gonna be a really good strategy in 2024. Again, this is something I know you've heard a million times, but when times are tight the way they are kind of right now, having a network is just another additional safety net for you. Senior motion designer and School of Motion TA, Jen Van Horn writes in, diversify your network. Build relationships with motion designers who can do what you can do, do what you don't wanna do, do what you can't do, and people who don't wanna do what you can. Basically, she's just saying, Network with a lot of different kinds of motion designers, ones that are like you, ones that are the opposite of you. And this will pan out and work out for you in ways you can't even imagine. First of all, it's just good to have friends in general in life, but especially professionally, it's really good to have a group of people that understand the same thing you're going through as a motion designer. You know, I can't go complain to my wife about the After Effects render crashing or something like that. She doesn't use After Effects, she doesn't really know what that means. But I can complain to my colleagues at School of Motion or I can complain to you know my other motion designer friends I have in the industry. And I can't overstate how valuable that is when you're stressed out or when there's a technical problem you don't know how to solve or when you're bogged down and you just need an extra hand. Can someone like spare a day and help me? And what always ends up happening is you end up giving each other work. And this is really where the networking, I think is gonna be very valuable this year. If you have a network of freelance friends, 
inevitably, some are gonna be busier than others, and if you have a good relationship with each other, you're gonna pass work back and forth, you're gonna try to help each other out, it's human nature. Now, how do you find this magical group of friends? Okay, well, the best way you can do it is also the hardest, it's not accessible to everybody, but I'm gonna recommend it is if you can find a way to go to an in-person motion design event, unbelievable ROI. So if there's a motion design meetup, anywhere around your geographic area, find out when it is and go to it. Even if there's only five people there, five people is the beginning of an amazing network. Or you can go to a big industry event like NAB, which is coming up in April and we are throwing our MoGraph meetup party once again. Hundreds of motion designers come every single year. It's unbelievable. And then you can network there. You can network all week at the event itself. It's a hell of a lot of fun. I promise you, you're gonna get ROI out of it come to Vegas, have some fun, I'll buy you beer. But if those options are not available to you for any reason, you can still do this online. And I think the easiest way to get started there is to just use sites like X slash Twitter or LinkedIn, Instagram to a smaller extent, that's not, not as much of a social network. It's almost more like a promotional channel for yourself, but X and LinkedIn are really great ways to just sort of like get your name out there, join the conversation, comment on people's posts, like things, add people on LinkedIn, do that sort of thing. But don't stop there. That's where a lot of artists stop. They do that and then they have like 500 connections on LinkedIn and they think they have a network. You don't have a network. What you then need to do is actually talk one-on-one -on -one with people. You can do that through DMs, you can email people, you can set up Zoom calls, and then hopefully that eventually leads to an opportunity to join a Slack group or a Discord group or start your own. And you don't need 100 people in it, you need like three or five or 10. And it's not that hard to sort of start seeing, okay, these are the types of artists that I like what they're saying, I like their work, I think we get along professionally, I'm gonna reach out and just introduce myself. And on that topic, let's talk about social media because we got some thoughts on that as well. So Austin Bowens, co-founder of Revi Studio, he says, put yourself online. Way too much competition in this space to sit on our introverted laurels or high horses about anti-social media takes, if you want work, that is. Any way that you can show your work and your personality is gold. I agree 100% with Austin. Now I will say, Austin and Ravi have had incredible success using social media. It's their primary sales channel. Now, I think part of the reason is that Austin is exceptional at social media. And you know what I mean. There are people that just get how social media works. They know what to write so that it's gonna be sticky and viral. And on top of that, Austin's work and Ravi's work and everybody there is just stellar. And so that really, really does help. However, even if that isn't your thing and your work isn't quite there yet, maybe you're new, that's okay. There are still lots and lots of benefits from being on social media and posting, not the least of which is it helps you network like I just said. Now this was an interesting take. Julie Craft, hot take, this platform is irrelevant. Julie was referring to X, so I posted on X, I posted on LinkedIn, and Julie replied on X to me. Now there was a reply to this. Again, from Austin Bounds, we get most of our work from folks seeing it on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, in that order, so can't say I agree. And then I did a little research and I saw that the all-time organic traffic on X is actually at an all-time high. It is quite a bit higher than before Elon Musk bought Twitter. So I was trying to reconcile the idea that this platform is relevant with it's objectively busier than it's ever been. I will say I sort of agree with Julie on this because Twitter X, when I used to go to it, it felt a little bit more like the water cooler and you would see conversations about motion design happening. And then in the replies, you'd see little mini conversations and it did feel a little bit more community-ish. Now when you go to it, I think they've kind of changed the algorithm to try and get you to stick on Twitter for longer. So they're showing you a lot of other things than what you came for. They're showing you a ton of AI stuff a ton of political stuff. I mean, it, it depends on who you're following too, but Twitter doesn't feel as easy of a place to just like stumble upon motion design conversations. So in that sense, I do think that Julie has a point. But to Austin's point, I do think that as far as pure volume and the sheer number of people on it and opportunities and artists to follow and the amount of activity that studios and artists are um, you know, putting into their, their X profiles and their, their persona on there, I think that you really need to be on there. I think that it's a really amazing way to have real conversations and to me, X feels like the place where ideas go to bubble up for better or worse. And then you've got LinkedIn. LinkedIn has actually become a juggernaut 
in the social media world in the last two to three years. And I actually just saw a chart from someone at School of Motion saying, hey, this is weird. Out of all the social media platforms that we're on, LinkedIn is actually directing the most traffic to our site right now, which has not been the case in previous years. So LinkedIn is also really, really hot right now. And there's a ton of conversation about motion design on there all day long. In fact, when I posted about this episode and I asked for responses, I got way more on LinkedIn than I got on X. Although the responses I got on X, I think were a little spicier and a little more interesting. So consider that too. But my point is this, I think that those are probably the two most high leverage social media platforms you can use. You can pick one, you can pick the other, you can pick both, totally up to you. But use them to start to like inch your way towards a relationship, a one-to-one -one relationship with artists and with potential clients. That's another strategy you can use. And if you wanna learn more about that, go check out Motion Hatch. But if you don't have access to an in real life, real person network or an event you can go to, a motion design meetup or coming to NAB, then online is the second best way to do it. So the last topic I wanna get into here is Wayne Gretzky. You're confused, I can see that. Okay, so Wayne Gretzky's mindset when he played hockey was I'm going to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. In motion design, where has the puck been? Well, it's been with fancy explainer videos for tech companies or SaaS businesses. It's been for social media campaigns. It's been for big branding projects. The puck is still there, but the puck's moving. Where's the puck going? Well, Nikolai Bolton wrote in and he said that some of the best motion design is done by YouTubers slash video essayists, especially when it comes to storytelling. That entire scene should not be overlooked when looking for talent or innovative ideas. And he's right. If you watch a Mr. Beast video, there's a ton of production value in there. They're clearly doing like fairly high level visual effects. They clearly have motion designers working on the channel. And there are so many big YouTubers and YouTube channels and networks that are solely on YouTube now. And this is also a phenomenon that's making its way onto X. There are video bloggers who are putting content on there exclusively. And so these are more opportunities kind of breaking away from the traditional broadcast and streaming worlds. And now you're talking about the creator economy. And the creator economy, it's really referring to this trend of having sort of individual creators that build a following talking about woodworking or whatever it is. And they end up having to increase their production value and scaling their production, but they don't actually know how to do that as well as say a Netflix. And so they end up leaning on video editors and motion designers and professionals like us to help them do that. And there's a ton of opportunity there. I got a very interesting message from Noah Oust. And by the way, I recommend you check out his work. It is wild, super talented guy. And with this message, he was actually commenting on something I posted about AI and video generators, not really impressing me right now. And he said that he sees content bifurcating into engagement content and brand positioning content with less and less middle ground. You can optimize for aesthetics or virality, but these are fundamentally different disciplines. Sometimes a teenager making funny noises is a better strategy. And this is brilliant. He's exactly right. I've never heard it put this way, but basically what he's saying is, look, you've got the prestige jobs that we all got into motion design to do, these Super Bowl commercials or doing a rebrand for a really cool, well-known global brand. That's the brand positioning stuff that Austin's talking about, and you can optimize for that. But then you've got virality, and virality, like it or not, actually often drives sales and drives brand awareness and drives business results better than having the beautiful thing that's expensive to make. And so motion designers are uniquely positioned to do both. You can work on the high-end brand positioning stuff or you can work on the, I guess, lower-end virality stuff, which often has shorter timelines, lower budgets, but can often have just as much creativity. The final result may not impress your friends as much, but there is probably gonna be damn near an infinite amount of that work out there. And Noah's comment was in response to me talking about generative AI video. And I was thinking, you know, this video is basically so bad at this point, it's, it's useless for anything professional. And his point was, yeah, but if you can generate a really funny video of security camera footage of someone standing around in boots that are 50 sizes too big for their feet, and it looks really silly, well, that's gonna go viral and a brand can tap into that. And that is such an inexpensive marketing campaign. It's inevitable that that's gonna become a thing. 
but you still have to have the taste and you still have to understand aesthetics and you have to understand art direction to even have a chance of that working out very well. And so these are still skills that motion designers have. So my point that I'm trying to make here, and this is in the context of saying, I think you should try to aim at being a full stack designer to maximize your odds of success in this environment. If you tend to be good at making things that are weird or edgy or go viral, know that that is a skill, a marketable one that you can add to your skill stack. And finally, in keeping of the theme of going to where the puck is going to be, well, the puck is already here, but I think it's gonna continue moving closer to here. And by here, what I mean is companies that are deeply entrenched in the world of web design, web development, product design, product development, sometimes called UI and UX. Here is a job opening for a motion designer at Figma's brand studio. And I wanna call out what the base salary is. The range is 119 to $253,000 a year. And you're almost certainly gonna get some stock options and great benefits too. These types of roles and this level of pay is still out there at the right companies. It may be harder to find at the Fang companies, the Googles, the Netflixes, the Apples, the Facebooks, but I would look elsewhere. I'd look to the web flows. I'd look to the framers. I'd look to the Vercells and the Figmas because this world is exploding. It's like the big bang. And you better believe that companies like that are still gonna want traditional linear motion design, but you also better believe that they are gonna want motion designers who understand the concepts involved in interaction design and runtime design and can maybe hop seamlessly between Cinema 4D and Spline doing one thing for a video, doing another thing for a website. If you can get yourself there, you're gonna have so many opportunities. All right, so let's recap. I think 2024 might be the year of the full stack designer or full stack motion designer. The best designers and animators are always gonna be in demand, but there's options to stand out in other ways. You can learn to be more efficient by leveraging these new tools, or you can learn to be more diverse with your skill set and be more like a Swiss army knife that can be plugged into different projects. You could learn to design and animate and then implement those things interactively in Webflow for clients. That's a really valuable skill to have. And if you know how to design and animate, you know After Effects, you are like 75% of the way there. You know the hard part. The last 25% is not the hard part. Also, networking, obviously super important. In-person is the best way if you can swing it. If you can't, use social media, use online, but don't just use it the way most people do. Remember that the feed and posting and all of that, that is simply a way for you to make connections with individual humans. And then you actually need to connect with those humans one way or another. DM them, email them, get on a Zoom call, invite them to a Slack group, or see if you can get into that Slack or Discord group. That is how you're actually gonna create real connections with real people, and that's gonna help you out in ways you can't even imagine. Soft skills, also super important. If you do not have a clue how to find work on LinkedIn, please watch the School of Motion video linked in this description. It will teach you a whole bunch of tricks, or go read the Freelance Manifesto, or go look at the client code, or go check out Motion Hatch's content, but this is an investment you need to make. I think you need to develop soft skills if you don't have them already, and they are harder than technical skills to develop. They're a little bit scarier, but they pay off a lot better. And finally, look at where the puck is going. Linear motion design is not going anywhere. It's gonna be around for a very, very long time, but it may start to get diluted a little bit by the interaction design, which is gonna be a lot more interesting to brands at least for the short and medium term. I think in the long term, everything is just gonna keep expanding and growing. But interaction design, the ability to design and animate and implement interactive animations on a Webflow site, a Framer site, in an app, those things are so fricking valuable and they're only gonna get more valuable as the demand for them increases. We're in the early days of this and this is such a good skill to round out your motion design skill set with. And it's also a great place to look for employment or freelance opportunities. And that is it for this episode. I hope this gave you some things to think about. Maybe it gave you some ideas about how you can approach this year. I really wanna thank every single person that replied to me on X and on LinkedIn. Even if I didn't get to your comment in this video, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. It gave me a lot to think about and it helped our audience out a lot. Make sure you're subscribed to this channel so you don't miss anything. And please give this episode a like if you enjoyed it. And that is it for me. I'll see you next time.